And this week we're going to be going over blue zones and centenarians. And a blue zone is a region of the world where people commonly live active lives past the age of 100. And the most popular areas tend to be Okinawa, Japan, Sardinia, Italy, uh, Ikaria, Greece, Loma Linda, California, and Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica. And for this week's episode, I, Matt, took on Sardinia, Italy. Eric took on Okinawa, Japan. And I think we should start with America. And Mike took on Loma Linda, California, United States. Yeah. Well, what is a blue zone? (laughs) Do we know? Yeah. So essentially, yeah, there's there's these very isolated areas, right, in different areas of the globe. And before we get into even, I think, like each individual one, there are a lot of, I would say, just similarities that all of them have um, collectively. Um, Loma Linda specifically has some things they do that are a little bit different than what you guys are, are going to be speaking on, Okinawa and Sardinia. Uh, but there are a lot of things that are very similar. And I think um, just in doing my research about it and then glancing over uh, some of those other areas that you guys are covering, um, I mean, would you agree with me that there are a um, couple primary things that are involved? And one of them is, you know, family and community um, or like religion practice are all very big aspects of uh, all of their um you know, weekly practices. Right. Agreed. And then the other one was uh, mostly plant-based diet. So none of these really, really eat too many meats. Um, a lot of them eat mostly plants and vegetables and legumes. And then finally, I think the biggest one, or I'm sorry, the, the other one that not, not the biggest one, uh, but the other one was physical activity or some sort of just moderate physical activity. That's um, kind of, uh, daily active living that is just um, uh, an active lifestyle. Not so much, um, you know, getting into the gym and exercising hardcore for, you know, three to five days a week, but just uh, more laborious work going for walks through the, you know, through um, the woods and hikes and being out in wilderness um, or laborious jobs or things like that. So um, those are some of the big common things. Now, Loma Linda. Um, is a very concentrated, uh, uh, there's a very concentrated religious group called the Seventh day Adventists that are um, in uh, the Loma Linda area. And Loma Linda is geographically, it's about 70 miles east of LA in California. So um, it is kind of isolated with this large religious um, community. And they have an interesting practice, which is on every Friday from sundown basically till sundown on Saturday. So basically all day um, on Saturday, they observe uh, just a religious day or a Sabbath where they disconnect from all of work. Uh, Loma Linda is a very, there's a bunch of universities there. So there's a very, it's a very scientific um, area. So there's a lot of people that have science jobs, um, universities, professors, things like that. So there's a lot of research going on there as well. And they basically, uh, these Seventh-day Adventists, shut down. And on Saturdays, uh, they basically just meet in church. They observe, um, you know, rest, recovery, time with their family, time in their community. Uh, They're very engaged in the practice of kind of stopping and smelling the roses and enjoying life and enjoying life with one another, whether that's playing games or doing things that make everybody feel connected. And so there is this community of connectedness that's going on um, where people are only spending time with other people who are, you know, just good people who are, who are sharing the same values. And so that, that is another big reason that they're seeing. And so when we kind of look at, did you guys read the book by Robert Saplosky called uh, "Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers," or have you heard yes. of it? Yeah, so it basically mm-hmm. talks about the, our, our primitive kind of stress response, things that we've talked about in previous podcasts, our fight or flight response, and how um, you know after a zebra get is done getting chased and they they get away, 
they relax and they don't they don't stay in this fight or flight mode like we live in uh, most of america lives in this chronic stress response for a long period of time um the loma linda people observe this sabbath on saturdays but also they they also partake in all of these other healthy habits that we talked about you know eating healthy foods which is the basis of their religion um you know daily physical activity sharing community with friends and family um, these are all really important practices to get them out of that stress response and feeling, as we would call it, you know, scientifically more parasympathetic or rest and digest. So it's that stress response, as we know, that creates a lot of chronic disease and illness uh, in people. And so Loma Linda has a much smaller percentage of that. And one of the really interesting things about Loma Linda, I, I believe, I, I forget how many years, this wasn't many years ago, maybe. Uh, 10 years ago or so when, when uh, Dan Buettner did his study on all these blue zones. But basically, um, he talked about the average lifespan of the men in Loma Linda was 89, whereas um, American men are typically the, the average lifespan uh, goes to about 78. So we're talking uh, 11 years longer for the men who live in Loma Linda. So 78 average man in America. 89, uh, yeah, 89 for a Loma Linda male. And then for the women, it was 81 for uh, the average lifespan for an American average woman. And 91, 91 was the average lifespan for a female in Loma Linda. So we're talking 10 to 11 years plus on the average lifespan of the people in Loma Linda versus the rest of the United States. And I, I mean, I think that just in itself is remarkable and enough why they went and started to study some of these blue zones and figure out, you know, why are these little concentrated areas? What are the practices? What are the behaviors? What are the lifestyle factors that are in play here on why people are living much longer, healthier lives? And then one of the big things too, is we talked about, there's not a lot of meat in their practice. And I was even listening to this one woman, they don't eat a lot of sweets. And especially in Loma Linda, they drink very little some of the other cultures, like I think, Matt, you probably um, talk about Italy, and I know they do drink a little bit more, but Loma Linda, they do not drink all that much. Some do. There's a very small factor. They don't smoke, so they don't partake in all these other unhealthy habits. Um, but the meat thing I thought was interesting. And then one of the women I was watching this interview, this woman who was, I think, 102, and she said, oh, yesterday I cheated and had a little piece of candy, but I didn't think to myself it was bad. I just thought, oh, it just made me sweeter. And so it was really just interesting to listen to her perspective and her outlook on how she like, and I think that in itself are her thoughts about it are enough to drive um, a positive stress response, you know, that, that we've talked about and how the way that you view something or the way that you view stress or the effect of something has a huge part into how that person um, is actually affected on a physiological level. Um, so yeah, that's Loma Linda. Nice. Um, yeah, there's definitely some commonalities I can already see between my country and yours already, but we'll save that for the end. Let's uh, let's hear some Okinawa. Tons of similarities, but um, Okinawa. So it's southern end of Japan. It's an island off of Japan's Big Island. And some background: it was a big battle. It was basically war torn in World War Two. They miraculously made a rebound and now is one of these blue zones so kind of background history of it like mike said they have a big social network it's called i might mispronounce this Maui, which is a life circle of friends and they also go through this big thing of ikigai which is reason for meaning um so those are big two two big things that are ingrained in their kind of belief system and what kind of aids into them living so long. Just like Mike said, plant-based was huge. I read up to 300 grams of vegetables a day. And we're talking vegetables of sweet potato, um, other veggies. They eat a lot of rice, legumes. And they said maybe about 2% of their diet is meat. So another country where they are very low on the meat intake, which is – seems to be a key uh, they do have a high intake of daily herbs a lot of ginger uh, turmeric 
bunch of herbs that grow on the island out there. So the island is a volcanic island. So it's rich in natural resources of the soil, vitamin C. Um, they get vitamin D consistently in that temperate zone. So uh, the big thing was it said that three to four times more veggies than the average person. And on Okinawa, the life expectancy is 82, which is five years longer than anyone in the U.S. And of stats that I got, at one point I, I got eight, over 800 centenarians. And then another stat I got, they have 2,600 between 1976 and 2004. Um, that's kind of what I got from Okinawa, but I'm sure, like Mike said, there's a lot of overlap in lifestyle, diet, behavior, uh, fitness that we can all dive into. And what I did find interesting is um, on the island, it said most people spend about 90% of their their life within five miles of their home. Not a big, big island, but to think that people aren't going far and they have that sense of community right around that radius. That's pretty interesting. Hmm. Eric, I think I read somewhere too that a large part of their diet comes from sweet potatoes, like something like 60 to 70%. Yeah, yeah. I got 67% on one study wow. I read, which is amazing. <laughs> that's huge. That's like almost two thirds. It is two thirds. Um, I think that's interesting because we just talk about like the Atkins diet and keto and these low carb diets. And one thing that's common is most of these different diets are like 70% plants and carbs right and a very like a you know small percentage of fats and very small percentage of meat i just think that's really interesting and it's something to think about we always talk about um, low carb diets and how they're healthier for you and this and that for burning fat but in reality um the proof is kind of in the pudding when you look at some of these blue zones and um you know i think it just comes down to the right type of carbohydrates you know at the end of the day Right. And, and what's your setting? I mean, the, it's amazing if you eat sweet potatoes that much, but they're, I'm sure their diets are completely different than what the Western world looks like. You walk down the street, right? you're not seeing home gardens and everyone picking their own food. You're seeing McDonald's, Dunkin' Donuts, Burger King. Right. That's what I would think. And a lot of the times like rice and sweet potatoes act more of like a resistant starch and act like a fiber in the system anyway. But yeah, I mean, you know, it is important to think that even some of these places are still eating legumes and other carbohydrates that might be um, looked down upon in, in the States. But I think too, it also plays a role that, you know, they're not eating a lot of meats. So there's something to that equation. There's something to that, that, that chemical reaction in the body that allows for any type of potato or vegetable or fruit. But when you don't have the excess meat in the system, then it's able yeah. to process everything accordingly and not get like backed up. Along with that, everyone, everyone's being pretty active. No one has like that, that it doesn't, it doesn't sound like people have the state where they're, sitting for 10 hours out of the day and then you know go home and sit some more and then just lay about in bed the rest of the night and, um, they just seem like they're, they're very kind of yeah. naturally and thing active too, just like we talked about communities um i think it was episode one about just the state of wheat today versus back then and you know how americans have you know genetically and biologically changed the wheat and, they, and just to produce more yield, um, I don't think they do that the same there, right? And so if they are eating cereals and different grains in their carbs, which I think, you know, especially in the Chinese culture, I know that they do, um, they certainly are not modifying their wheat like we were or like we are today. And I think that plays a huge part in it as well and how the body um, responds to it from a, bio or from a um, physiological standpoint. And Mike, when, when you were doing your research on California, what was their – did they kind of have a secluded diet? Because it's interesting because all the other these other places are kind of secluded throughout the world and then it's just like California, yeah. which is in the heart of the Western diet. It, it, did you find well, anything It that wasn't was so much that kind of as much as it part? was um, the Seventh-day Adventist's um, uh, perspective. And so the Seventh-day Adventist church 
um, not only do they have that observation of the Sabbath on Saturday, but they're also one of their main priorities is that they they view the body as a temple and that the body should only be receiving good whole natural foods. And so it doesn't have so much to do with what they have access to. I mean, being in LA, I know that it's, you know, or not too far from LA, I'm sure there are a lot of horrible, you know, genetically modified foods that are easy to access for people in Loma Linda. The real thing there is the, the, the religious community is so tight and they, the, one of the most important aspects of their religion is that, and you'll see this too, because I think there's about 25 million, uh, seventh day Adventists around the world. Um, a Loma Linda just has a higher, a higher concentrated areas, um, you know, in, within, within that area of California. Uh, but they are spread out around the world, but you'll see it in other, um, cultures as well, where there are more seventh day Adventists. And so that's really the main, um, outlying thing with them is they, they, with, you know, with their religion, they feel very strongly that the body should be viewed as a temple and so that they shouldn't be putting bad things into it. And so that's like, pri- that's like literally priority number one with their religion is take care of yourself because your body is a temple. Yeah. Gotcha. Makes sense. Cause I mean, I'm sure the amount of stuff out there. And it's a very high it's educated like have area. Here. Cause as I said, there are, are many universities and different research centers that are in Loma Linda, especially like Loma Linda university is a very, um, a uh, very, uh, you know, uh, concentrated area where they do a lot of research and, and there's a lot of scientists. So it's a very educated area as well. Um, and there's not hardly any overweight people there as well, you know, for, for multiple factors, obviously the diet, but the physical exercise, um, it plays a huge part in it and the low levels of stress, you know, they're all very happy people that the, um, the guy, Dan Butner, who did all, he went to all these different, uh, the five zones that Matt um, was talking about at the, the um, front end of the podcast here. And he basically, in Loma Linda itself, interviewed 100 different people, uh, I believe, who were at least 90, between 90 and like 110. And um, and he said they were all very cheerful, very happy people to be around. Um, not like, you know, when you're, you know, essentially having a conversation with a, a senior and you're kind of looking at your clock on your watch, like, oh, when's this going to be over? Um, you know, it can be kind of painful. He said all these people were extremely pleasant. Um, so that, you know, that all that stuff is really interesting to me. So I'm going to go ahead and, um, explain Sardinia because it really isn't too much different except some, um, specifics into the diet and stuff like that that are just more unique to the region um and maybe that their activity might be more re- unique to the, to the region but um kind of a lot a lot of common characteristics just in the way that they view life um across the board between your two cities or, or areas so Sardinia, Italy is a small island off of Italy in the Mediterranean Sea. And um, they're known for having really just mild, rainy winters, long, warm summers. Has a unique, uneven, rocky terrain that makes it less suitable for any large scale type farming. So there's a lot of smaller type farms and shepherds who have um, herds of goats or herds of sheep and um, because there's less of a terrain for big equipment and and cars really a lot of people end up walking more Um, they really pride themselves on valuing family and friends and they're known for their sense of humor and laughter Um, they're very proud hard-working people that live off their their own land So most actually make their own wine or, um, you know, have their own farms where they get their own dairy from their goats or their sheep and grow their own vegetables and um, harvest their own beans and stuff like that. Um, They have they have a a funny tradition of um, 
like they really respect their elderly. So they have an honorary mayor. When you turn the age of a hundred, you become honorary mayor for the year, which I thought was pretty interesting just to kind of like celebrate people's lives. And um, you don't see that as much in this country anymore, where it's like, it used to be like respect your elders. And now it's like people, you can even see people cut older people off at the grocery store all the time or on the street or wherever they are on a sidewalk and just, just a, a major lack of respect for our elders. Um, it was an interesting area because they were really proud of the fact that this area, men and women lived just as long, whereas in most other blue zones, you know, the women would outlive the men on average a couple of years. The, Mike, what you said, the drinking it's pretty interesting. They talk about um, having two fingers wide of wine at lunch and no more than that. More for the, you know, resveratrol, I'm sure it is. The scientists would look at it, but for them, it's more of it symbolizes getting together with their loved ones, uh, friends or family and sharing good stories and sharing laughter as you enjoy uh, like the first meal of the day. And I'll go into I have like a little excerpt from a, a typical day in Sardinia, but I want to dive into their diet a little bit because there's some interesting information on this. Um, you know, they have whole grain breads. They have, for the most part, they have whole grain breads, garden vegetables, fruits, beans, uh, cheeses from goats. So very low lactose um, quantity, if 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 some at all. So it really doesn't affect anybody the way it does the dairy in this country. And meat is saved for Sundays or special occasions. Now, before the 1950s, diet was actually like cereals, legumes, potatoes, vegetables, a lot of herbs, like Menchu was saying in, in uh, Okinawa. They ate chestnuts, walnuts, figs, grapes, and they only had meat maybe once a month. They didn't even really have fish. Uh, their dairy came from goats and sheep, and they had little wine and, and, and really low in calories type of diet. And the modern day diet in Sardinia is more meats, more white breads, more pasta, 56% um, more consumption of olive oil, 50% more fish, 55% more meat, um, which is interesting because kind of like what you guys were saying, the, you know, they are still low on the meat scale comparatively to the United States, but still higher than what they were doing in the 1950s. And it's it's interesting because they're, they've still been a blue zone. They still had a very high life expectancy, but we would, you know, in America, we would want to associate more animal fat and more meats with an increased risk of chronic disease. Uh, so I thought that was pretty interesting that even though their meat consumption went up 55%, they're still a blue zone. Um, their potato consumption dropped about 45% and um, fresh fruits and vegetables went up 60%. Uh, for beans, so this is where it gets into the nitty gritty details where the, the devil's in the details because everyone wants to say beans are bad. Um, their, their most popular bean was the fava bean. It's a particularly high protein content, high fiber content bean um, that, but they traditionally soak it for anywhere from eight to 16 hours. So that actually helps remove any lectin content or basically the pieces that make it inflammatory or damaging to the gut. Um, and so the, their meat consumption went up to about four or five times a month and their bread known as Carta de Musica, it's like a flat bread but it's made from tritacum durum wheat, which is high in fiber, and it's got very, very little gluten. Um, no, so some say it's like insignificant to causing um, issues in the gut. Their grapes are known as cannanoa grapes, which tend to have two to three uh, times more of the good components of red wine than, say, what the grapes that we might find in, in Napa Valley or in other regions in Italy or even in France or whatnot. Um, and their cheeses come from, you know, milk from sheep or, or goats. So again, low lactose color, to, uh, quantity. Um, but so I want to read this little excerpt from one of the articles I found. And it was just talking about kind of 
joking at the secret to longevity is, is their lifestyle. And it's, it's true. Um, they said, for example, by 11 a.m. on any particular day, um, you know, a resident who's like 70 or 80, anywhere in that range could be um, already milked three or four cows, split half a quart of wood, slaughtered a calf and walked four miles um, of pasture with his sheep. After taking the first day's break, he gathers his grown children, grandsons, and visitors around their kitchen table. They enjoy this paper-thin flatbread called Carta de Musica. Small glass of red wine is poured, poured for everybody, and they enjoy slices of, of homemade pecorino cheese. Um, so yeah, you know the, the flatbread's made from that that special the specific type of wheat that's um, local to that region. Um, the cheese is again from sheep, so no issues in the gut there, and the wine's local as well. And it's really that they are just so active on a daily basis. They're not going to a gym. They're not running hill sprints. They're not um, clean and pressing for PRs every week. They're just staying active. They're staying happy. They enjoy uh, connecting with one another and sharing laughter and stories. Um, and just fascinating that these people in all three of these regions are the ones who are living the longest, who we come back to this country and, you know, you hear different products being marketed or different programs being marketed or different um you know, lifestyles being promoted in different books to promote long life. And I think the best people to learn from are the people who've historically been living long and happy, healthy lives. Well, like I said, the, the big thing is, and, you know, listening from me and Mike, you could probably say, oh, meat's a big factor. But then listening to yours and saying, okay, well, if they increase that 55%, well, we can kind of throw that correlation almost – almost out i mean there's probably some correlation someone can make out there but i think the biggest thing goes that you know basically a hundred percent of you know our diseases and obesity and heart disease is related to a poor diet i mean all of these places have just a substantial optimal diet that they follow and it's it's proven to work and quality of the diet or quality of the food you know because People say here dairy is terrible, dairy is bad, wheat's bad. Agreed, but if it comes from a good source, locally grown on an island, or from sheep or goat, I mean, I mean, look, there's the data says it. They're, they're living longer than us. How can you argue with that? Yeah, and what's crazy though is just like the perspective of that. Whereas if you go and talk to them, it's just they just in these interviews I'm reading, just, they're just talking like this. This is what we eat. This is what we normally eat. This is what our, our days look like this is what we have available to us they're not it's not like oh we make sure we eat really healthy or we make sure we make healthy choices you know in this country i'm sure we, we saw it all the time in the break room right at, at our gyms people walking by like oh you're eating healthy today and it's like no to, to me i'm just eating like i'm just putting few, good fuel in my body i'm not eating quote unquote healthy you, i'm just eating real food Whereas it's so easy in this country to be eating something that isn't real food and isn't good fuel and isn't good for your system and creates more stress in your internal environment and puts more toxins in your internal environment without even knowing about it. So I think a lot of what comes down to their diet in these regions is just it's just what naturally developed in those areas that they grow. grow right. And that's something to. we do very bad at here. It's always the next – greatest thing and you almost wonder i don't know the exact numbers on like okinawa or yours how much processed food are they um kind of exposed to if at any i mean i would assume okinawa is pretty pretty i mean not off the grid but pretty you know isolated island there. they're probably not getting these mass amounts of cereals bars and garbage Like they don't have yeah. – it's like out of sight, out of mind. They don't even have the – Right. The, the and it's like to it. go and get it might be out of their way, which could be, possibly be a big issue. I also found a stat that said um, 
if there are six or more fast food restaurants within a half a mile, people, anyone, anywhere in the wider world are 40% more likely to be obese compared to if you have like three places or left. And then you look at places like Boston or these major cities, you know, within a half a mile, you're getting at certain places, 10, 20, 30. And I think those places probably have a high respect for tradition, lifestyle, and not wanting to put in all this fast food, capitalism, growth, money-making businesses. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because, um, you know, it's just like, it's all about context. I mean, even when I was reading about um, Sardinia, I didn't think there'd be that many fruits, but they talked about how figs and grapes were very common for them to eat all year round. Like they would harvest enough and dry them out so they could have them in the winter. And one of the major arguments for why we shouldn't have fruit in this country, at least all year round, is like, well, it wasn't in season. So you need to have your body. And I I do get this argument. Like you you want a period of your body building up and you want a period of your body sort of breaking down. Um, But these people are, are eating in a way that it's grown or produced in the most natural environment that it's supposed to be in. I mean, if we take where we are right now, we kind of extrapolate another 50, 100 years from now, it's like we're going to be depleting even the soil of any nutrients. So it won't even matter if something is is grass-fed, right? It'll be like, well, this was um, soil-produced yeah. grass. This was, you know what I mean? We're going to be so specific because the grass uh, of like 100 years ago, full of minerals and vitamins and nutrients, is not going to be the same grass fast forward another 200 years with the way we're going. It's going to be yeah. nutrient empty. So it's just funny when you can kind of boil it down to at least in, at least in, you know, in Okinawa and Sardinia, I didn't know, I didn't catch it too much in Loma Linda, but well, and they lived off their the land. Thing. They all had different, you make. know, different resources. I mean, we're talking different climate zones, different, you know, stuff to eat so you almost wonder and i think this is where um the california is impressive because they're almost like in this westernized world and they're doing this with their their own you know you know willpower belief system whereas you almost wonder if if america didn't you know go agriculture what what would we live off of you know what were the hunter and gatherers living off of here and would that be viable? I think you'd have more farming. I think you'd almost have, I feel like we all would have been born into like a plantation because our, our forefathers would have had to be continually farming and holding on to livestock right, so to feed their What do you families. think would be our, like, but, I mean, bananas don't grow in the U.S. So it's, you know, certain areas. Like our, <laughs> yeah, like climate zones. You almost crop, wonder, you're saying? you know, would – would the northern states be more if it was natural wheat and corn? Would could they have the capacity to have these blue zones? But we've tarnished everything that we put in the soil here, so we can't really have a a notion. Yeah, that's a great question, and I almost think our cash crop became corn not because of its health value, but because of its profitability. And people looked at the wrong, people prioritized the wrong thing when they were kind of figuring out what was the the best cash crop. Um, But yeah, that's a really interesting question. What was was it naturally growing here? I don't don't really know the exact answer. I could do research, but... I know there were there were quite a, a lot of buffalo I mean, roaming, the, and the I don't think States. I don't think the meat thing is wrong. I think you see a lot of cultures that do eat a lot of meat or fish and be able to survive and live to old ages. I think it's what we've come to know as our meat now, pesticide, you know, because look at the um, up in Alaska, the tribes just ate whale and fish and they survived, and that's you know that's all they kind of had, so. 
I definitely think it's well. Stats say it's more lifestyle than anything. You know, twenty percent of it is is your genetics, and eighty percent is kind of dictated by how we live. And I think that's a big thing. I think it's not. People think that oh, you live to a hundred, it's good genetics. You know, some of it is, but it also is yeah. like somehow how you take care of yourself and live your life. Now there'll be, I'm sure there'll be outliers. You know. You hear the people you know, drink whiskey and smoke cigars, yeah. live to 105. That's great. You know, do your thing. But on average, if you can see over these blue zones, these lifestyles are pretty regimented, uh, pretty built into the society. And if everyone follows along, you're seeing results. Yeah, I that think I would, I would also say too, to in this country, stress and um, just the stress of the lives that we, you know, the average American faces versus like the stress that people in these blue zones are facing or or deciding not to face i think that plays a huge factor into it well as well i mean have you ever uh seen somebody who haven't seen in years like let's say five ten years and you know they just like had kids they were sleep deprived chronic stress you know their job is crazy busy and then you see them they look like they've aged like 15 years and five years um i think you know it is right. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. But again, as, as uh, like Eric was saying, like I think said, it plays a huge part into the environments, you know, just the stat you are saying in regards to like where having fast food close by to your community is a factor on whether you would go there or not and, and actually eat it. And I, I think environment and the, the people like the seventh day Adventist is a great example of, they all adopt that, type of lifestyle um together it, as a community and they go through it as a community and you know again like if there are people who are not adopting it they probably i'm not sure they cast them out but they're they're probably not exactly um you know people that are partaking in in the happy community based stuff that's going on and and all that stuff as we know laughing like you know i forget i think eric was just talking about or matt you were talking about the sardinians laugh a lot that in itself is a huge stress reducer. So, you know, just having fun, um, being together, and and then we talk about um, the food food aspect of it. A lot of these places are farming a lot of their own food. I mean, maybe not so much in Loma Linda. Um, they are eating very healthy and organic, and we know that there's a lot of organic stuff that is available uh, in mm -hmm. that area. But a lot of these other regions, you know, Sardinia is an island. Like, you, you're not going to have these massive shipments of food coming in from everywhere else, they're eating what they can essentially farm there. And a lot of them are farming it themselves, which plays a huge part into the physical activity that they're getting on a daily basis. So um, when you look at, I, I don't think it's any one thing like we talked about, and that's why we see so many of these similarities in all of these different zone, uh, blue zones. It's really kind of like the entourage effect. I think of all of these things I don't think you can isolate any any one, two, or even three of these different lifestyle habits or behaviors that they have, and say that the person who adopts two or three of these things is going to have, you know, a, a long life and live to be a hundred. I think that it's an entourage effect and, a, and like a compounding effect of all of those different aspects. Um, you know, there's a there's an overwhelming amount of healthy ha habits and behaviors that each of these zones are are um you know taking advantage of in a comparison to like you know your average american for example right and and every country every region they have some sort of form of daily activity some form of um um, consistent nutrition, which is just eating the foods that are readily available. And they've learned based upon their, their forefathers, their ancestors, how to traditionally prepare certain dishes, which have avoided the inflammatory compounds uh, without having to, you know, send it to a lab. Um, I mean, Italians have just sort of naturally always de-skinned and de-seeded their tomatoes and but voila, there, there, or ta-da, there's all the lectins removed from it and then soaking the beans and stuff like that. Um, you know, they, they naturally do 
um, stress management, and they naturally avoid toxins. They don't allow it into their system. They don't allow it. They don't allow big agriculture and big big government to take control over things to mass produce things and make a profit. Now back to a couple points that were being made because it reminded me of something was their lifestyle choices and they all three do have a sense of community which gives you a sense of purpose but which also gives you a sense of of fulfillment and enjoyment in one's own being a friendly neighbor and having the the company of your fellow neighbor whereas in this country it's very much um a focus and a drive uh to retire And it's almost has a negative connotation. It's like, well, if I work my butt off now, I'll get to, you know, stop working and enjoy my life. Like, what's the point? What's the point of working yourself into overweight heart, heart issues or hypertension, high blood pressure, lack of sleep, um, 60 hours a week, avoid your family, doing it for 20, 30 years, just to stack a lot of money so you can retire. I mean, all of all of the people in Sardinia value working. I mean, these guys are talking about being 75 years old, 80 years old, 85 years old, and still going out and chopping wood or milking their sheep or walking their, their uh, goats. Um, and they talked about how like, it was an insult if, if people even talked about retirement homes. It was just a natural thing that you grew old and you died with your family. It's just a very different way of viewing life um, in those cultures compared to here. Whereas I just feel like so many people are willing to sacrifice their, their good health or their, their good choices or good lifestyle or their, whatever they have at a young age so that they can retire quote unquote, when they get older. Um, when people don't realize that, you know, you retire in poor health and what's the point anyway, if you can't even be active, you, you have to, maintain your healthy active lifestyle and keep your health up so that you yeah, can Matt, save there, your money there was a, there was one thing on, this is, you know, reminds me something interesting that came up in my research i was listening to an interview um, of some they, of the they, people of loma linda and they were talking about what they do later on in their life like 60s 70s even 80s is they take up uh things that are mentally challenging that they've never done before so they they try to, yeah, they try to essentially challenge themselves with learning new skills or things that they're not, they've never done before. Awesome. And so because that it's very mentally engaging and a lot of these, not just these people are living to be a hundred, but these people who are living to be a hundred are all there mentally. Like, you, you know, they're, they're interviewing these people and I'm seeing some of the conversations we're have they're having with them. And I'm just like, Oh, these people are totally with it, you know, and they don't even move like your typical hundred year old. Like they move really well. They walk fast. They get up and down stairs just fine. It's, um, and I think part of that is too, they're really engaging their brain and they're really challenging. And when you do challenge yourself mentally, I do think that like we talked about in the past, it keeps those, uh, motor neuron patterns firing in the brain. It builds, you know, deeper, stronger connections throughout the, 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 um, uh, the brain, the synapses. And, you know, that's really a big reason of why they are so all there mentally still into those later ages of their life. Yeah, I get to agree. Cause I mean, it's funny you, met, you mentioned that stuff. Cause I have a, a, a great aunt that's 93, about to be 94 and she does accounting still and she'll do all this knitting and and computer programming and it's amazing but it's built around the community uh she lives in down in florida it's based around a community that does the same thing on a daily basis and it's just like well there's got to be some correlation with that you know using neurons has got to be a huge part of it and also like the aspects of of especially i think what was interesting about right um the california is they're living in the modern world. You know, Science they have the guys. stresses of making money, <laughs> yeah. retire at 65. You almost wonder, yeah, but but they figured it out. And you almost wonder with these other countries, are they almost, I don't want to say like back decades, yeah. but are they living a different completely life than ours? Are they just, you know, they're doing this to get by, they're farming for a living, you know, they li- might not be living off of much. Um, 
but it's, I think it's definitely great that we can see this happening in this country. So people are like, well, that's just where you live. Well, no, it's not. It can happen wherever. Um, I'm sure there's small pockets of, you know, different communities and groups of people yeah. throughout this and, you country know, that have the similar practices. Yeah, I did, I did like how a lot of times um, in the research, even just in blue zones in general, they were talking about how um, scientists originally thought that it was all just genetic genetic based, but then they realized that um, they kind of had a, a small pool for genetic mm. uh, diversity, so they they had to kind of rule that out because, as you know, you know, genetic diversity is really what stands the test of time technically but right and what we know now about were, epigenetics like, and, and how those types of just environmental factors play a part on those genes and whether they turn on or off or not and create diseases and illness uh it all starts to make sense that you know the the environment and the culture um continues to strengthen that genetic code that's written you know in these um in, in these small communities dna and you know it it the life expectancy kind of grows and grows. Um, when Eric, you were talking about, you said it, I think it was an aunt you have that um, is is in the nineties or eighties, nineties. Yeah, I have a my my grandmother. Nineties, uh, still February twenty second. She turns eighty nine, and I think I was saying before, like you know, she's already eight years past the average Americans um, females, you know, life life expectancy, and um, you know, she's still all there and she gets around and you know she she's slow but you know she's you can have a full conversation with her she knows what's going on in the world um you know she's she's not like you just you know she you can have a real conversation with her and what's really interesting is um she is a person of like very strong faith she's been going to church for a very long time you know, always saw Sunday as the day where she should relax. There's not going to work. It's all about family and community. Um, same thing with my Italian, both of my Italian grandparents passed away in the past few years, both at the age of 89. Um, and so, you know, when you kind of look at that, it's like, it, there is this sense of community and family, but the religion and the faith and having faith in something, um, a greater, a greater power, greater purpose. And that feeling of, you know, there is something out there that is kind of, um, directing my life and everything's going to be okay because of that. And I think that puts people at ease and that faith in your community and the people that are believing those, having those same beliefs. I think there's something to be said for that, for that, because I do experience it firsthand with my grandmother. And that's a big thing with her. She always says, you know, her, her faith in God is the thing that really, um, you know, puts her at ease. My, you know, my aunt just got uh, brain cancer, you know, diagnosed a couple weeks ago, stage four. And so, and that's my, my grandmother's daughter. And so she's like very at peace with it right now. And it's not something like most of their families freaking out about it. And my grandmother's like really calm and she's just saying, you know, God has a plan. And, you know, I really think that, you know, the faith and the religion that we see in all these other, you know, blue zones, I think that plays a, a, a huge role in it. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to definitely agree with that because I don't know the exact statistic of it, but I know they say, you know, the people who really don't have a, a good meaning or purpose in life tend to yeah. have a lower mortality age um, and just kind of even if they're fighting off disease, they just kind of, you know, they seem to just dwindle off or, or lose more sense of life and cognition before others. Yeah. So I definitely can agree with that stat. Um You guys will like listening to that podcast that I did with um, Todd Sylvester a second time because that's what we talked about was um, um, beliefs dictate behaviors and how it doesn't actually matter if you believe in God or not, but if you can believe in something that's greater than yourself, then um, that goes a long way. Like I, I, you know, I can specifically say that I'm more into nature and it all plays a role that way. But when you can believe that something else is more powerful than you, it's just, it's a humbling. There's something humbling about that too. Yeah. Know yeah. That thanks. I mean, we're, things we're, in this world that you can we'll, change. We'll get and through it. Things and, that you, you can't, know, but everybody's got a positive to attitude. Your, if anything, like, it's woken people up to start to really, I think there's good that comes out of tragedies a lot of times because a lot of times people, it really wakes people up 
you know, and, and makes them take a better care of themselves and, and the people around them and treat themselves kinder and better. So I, I think that, you know, while nobody wants anything like that to happen to anyone in their family, it is also important to, to learn the lessons from it um, that are, are happening around you, which is, you know, to take care of your body, view it as something that, um, you know, is something that you should, you know, really be only putting good, good positive things into that includes thoughts, because we know that it's not just about the external things. Um, you know, like Eric was saying, the circumstances, but it has a lot to do with, you know, how do you view those circumstances? What are those internal thoughts? Those are going to really play a huge part into how your body responds and the stress response to your body and, and how your physio physiology changes. We know from science that the thoughts can dramatically affect, you know, the body's physiology. And so we have to not just be feeding ourselves good foods and, and exercise and things like that, but, but good thoughts. And so uh, one of the other things we didn't really talk about, but a lot of these communities in that they do some form of praying or meditation, you know, aside from um, or, or alongside their religious practices. So, so it is something that they are finding a way to, you know, come to peace or uh, I don't want to say purge, but get rid of all the negativity or the negative um, space in their life and, you know, really find some sort of inner peace through, you know, getting rid of any of those bad negative thoughts and that becomes a practice and as we know with those with that practice um of doing that you start to condition yourself to think in a more positive way on a consistent basis and so less and less negative thoughts even enter in and i think that's a huge aspect of what a lot of these communities do i know especially for loma linda they do do praying and meditation it all works do we talk about also, why these people are living longer? Uh, do we didn't do we even mention that in the beginning? <laughs> what do you mean? Are you, what do you mean specifically? No, no, no like we talking about it's like, like the low podcast. risk of oh, see, yeah. diabetes, low risk of cancers. I, I right. Well, right. It's worth mentioning. It's worth mentioning. Why, yeah. why they're not having all that stuff? No, right, the fact I, that they're eating non-processed foods in their yeah, natural for our, state of our listeners that you know it's, yeah, just, it's not that they're just living you know to 100 but i mean they're having low risk of all mm -hmm. kinds of like mike was saying like cognitive like alzheimer's um cancer stroke type 2 diabetes i mean that's that's what's right. kind well, of playing you, a role here and driving let's just driving the longevity well that's what What's kind of scary is the fact that all that stuff is so common in this country and we lose sight of the fact that um, evidence for a lot of these diseases that yeah. might be so common in the United States might not even be prevalent at all in some of these countries. So when we think of diseases, we have to remember how um, relevant that is to the exact country we're talking about. Um because there's even small occurrences of inflammatory bowel disease in, in Italy, but they're more in like central Italy and around Rome and areas that would have more processed foods and, and those toxins that we're talking about. But, um, you know, we're kind of running, running out of time here, but I think to recap, you know, they all had a sense of community. They all enjoyed laughter and friends and family and, and love and interconnectedness between one another. They all seem to eat foods again in their natural state of production that are non-processed and not, um, you know, subject to hormones or pesticides and stuff like that. Uh, um, well, the, yeah, the big ones for me some other that I saw that you were to touch just on the, before we, before we, wrap we talked about what, kind of what Eric was just saying that that lack of disease, and the lack of, um, you know, major health complications that keep people healthy. There is a, there's a huge pattern of, um, stress reduction and through different avenues, through feeding the body, healthy foods, through, you know, community and religious practices, you know, having some sort of higher power that they have faith in, um, taking a break, which is kind of what we, what we talk a lot of times about with fasting or with, um, some sort of contrast, meaning, you know, being in a chronic state of stress all the time from their busy job and, 
working in even working from home, you know, when you're supposed to be at home, spending time with your family, um, they take a break from that even. And so it's having that, um, acute stress instead of chronic stress. And that acute stress, as we know, allows the body to build up resilience and actually get stronger. And so they have a lot of, a lot more acute stress in their lives, uh, through the form of that, you know, daily act, uh, active lifestyle. They don't really eat, you know, bad foods or red meat even, and, or any kind of meat whatsoever. So, um, a lot of, a lot of really, you know, overall healthy trends. I was, I would say like, if you were to adopt a lifestyle that, that, you know, allows you to live a very long, healthy life, we have to pay attention to these blue zones and start adapting, um, a couple of these habits, you know, just, just a few that we feel, um, are low hanging fruit, you know, for us to, to be able to adopt. Yeah. And, and, and with that, you know, they've already shown that half a year to a year of practicing these lifestyle changes, mm-hmm. you're already seeing a huge increase of life expe- expectancy wow. up to three, three years prior. So even if you're out there listening, you gotta, you know, you know, take, take it serious and, and take a, page out of what they're doing in these books uh, from these blue zones. Cause you know, if you want to live longer, this is what you have to be doing. Yep. There's no better person to learn from than those who have already been doing it. And that wraps up blue zones and centenarians this month and this week. Stay tuned for next week's episode.